at home with ABOR's housing economist, Claire Losey. All right, guys, well, we're here with another episode of Driving at Home with Dr. Claire Losey. Uh, we're here on a Friday. That's not our normal recording day because we know we've got a big holiday next week. Claire, thanks for hopping on this morning. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. So it's June 30th, Friday, June 30th, which means we're nearly just a day shy, essentially, of the mid-year point. What um, what overall are your takeaways for the first half of the year from an economic standpoint, just at a global level? So generally speaking, we've experienced a fairly robust first half of 2023, particularly given our broader broader macroeconomic headwinds. Of course, inflation is still running fairly hot, although it has decelerated considerably over the past several months, really half year, year plus now coming in at about 4.4% on a year-over-year basis in June. And headline that's the headline figure. Then core inflation, which strips those more volatile categories of food and energy, coming in at about 5.3% on a year-over-year basis. So clearly still significantly elevated relative to that 2% target that the Fed is looking for. But overall, certainly decelerating. And then meanwhile, the labor market remains fairly robust. And that's kind of the story in the broader economy, the piece of the puzzle that really has helped the economy continue to churn amid these broader macroeconomic headwinds. And then most recently, as we've talked about in in a previous podcast, just the potential for more rate hikes by the Federal Reserve, again, as they're trying to bring inflation down to their 2% target. And overall, too, along with the labor market, just robust consumer spending, which again, held strong in May, we just received the data on that today, has and strong consumer balance sheets have really helped to steady the broader economy. So overall, I would say that particularly given the two kind of unforeseen events, that being the failure of three regional banks And then, of course, the debt ceiling crisis and potential impasse, which has certainly been resolved, but just the potential for that. Those two factors, coupled, again, with those broader macroeconomic lags, the economy has performed very well considering all of that. Do you feel like, as you think back to what you and other economists like yourself were thinking at the top of the year, do you feel like we have fared better than expected, as expected? What's your overall take as compared to where you were you were at the top of the year? I would certainly say that most of us would probably agree that we fared better than expected. There were a number of firms who were already predicting a recession to have occurred in the second quarter of 2023, even by by mid-year 2023. And as far as we know, we're not currently in a recession. Certainly consumer spending doesn't indicate that we are in pretty strong, pretty robust GDP growth, especially considering the two negative quarters of GDP growth that we saw in 2022. So overall, I would think that most of us would agree that the first half of 2023 has been more robust than expected. Again, particularly in the face of those two um, kind of unforeseen events, again, the the failure of those three regional banks and the potential for that debt ceiling impasse. Right. So despite these really unpredictable and relatively volatile events, we fared relatively well as compared to what we thought it could be for the first half of the year. Right. And And so how does that shape how you're feeling about the last half of the year and the kind of ongoing um, re- recession watch, I guess we should say, as we look towards the third and fourth quarters? Sure. That's a great question. So there are really two primary questions to consider when we're talking about a recession. The first of which is on everyone's mind, will there be a recession? But the second of which, and this to me is becoming more and more so actually kind of the the bigger question in the loop is, will it be a mild recession or, you know, to what extent, what will the magnitude of the recession be? And I think that as we've been able to delay a recession, the odds of us having a more severe recession have declined, i.e. the odds of us seeing kind of a more mild um, speed bump in the road, if you will, 
are probably a little bit higher if we do experience a recession. But it's really, it's going to, um, as to the question of whether we do or do not see a recession, it's really going to depend on the market's continued reaction to the rate hikes by the Fed. We're anticipating two more additional rate hikes, probably to the tune of 25 basis points each. I'm guessing probably in July and September, or if not July and the October, November meeting. So it's really going to depend on the market's reaction to that. But you have to also consider that we've we witnessed 10 consecutive rate hikes over the course of 2022 and 2023, the first half of this year, and um, to the tune of about five percentage points total. So, you know, an additional, say, call it 50 basis point rate hike total, um, you know, hopefully won't have a significantly detrimental impact. But again, I think the the focus now with respect to a recession is while there's still a lot of uncertainty as to whether we will experience one and the odds of us having a recession have declined as we've continued to to weather these broader macroeconomic lags fairly well. Again, the more kind of pressing issue or question becomes to what magnitude will the recession be? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so you're... One. You're, you're feeling relatively confident, I guess I'm gathering in, um, you know, the idea that we've kind of, we've mitigated against, we, we feel that the recession, if, should we have one, could be softer than previously expected. Exactly. And especially in the Austin region. So our growth as a regional economy has actually outpaced that of Texas at an increasing rate since or over the past couple of decades, I should say, really since since the 90s, um, the divergence in economic growth between Texas and Austin has widened. So that's indicative to us, right, that especially as a regional economy, should there be a national recession, we're even better poised to weather that well. Yeah. And I think for our agents, I mean, this is something for anybody who was in the business 2008 to 2009 and following the recovery there. This is something that Austin has experienced before where we sort of ride a less volatile ride in these larger economic shifts. And it takes a lot of work and communication with your clients, especially those relocating from areas that might be experiencing a more severe shift to say, hey, you know, not every market is the same and not every economy is the same. And this local economy is supported through these anchors. And these are the reasons that we're going to fare um, in a more firm and, and strong manner into, into next year. So I, you know, we just will continue to support agents ability to do that through this podcast and, and other programming so that um, they feel confident communicating with consumers that maybe don't understand that everything is local and location matters, right? Exactly. And two, we should remember that recessions, of course, the hallmark of one is unemployment, massive job layoffs. And just within the Austin economy over the past several years, in particular, in particular, we've witnessed very broad-based employment growth and just the attraction of new large employers relocating from other states, especially like California, you know, we have a strong employment base in that sense as well. And the other thing I would add to the other component is that, of course, affordability is certainly an issue within Austin itself. It has been and continues to be that of housing affordability, of course. But relative to other large cities on the East and West Coast, Austin remains fairly inexpensive, you know, for thinking about cities in California, cities, um, you know, like New York City, um, you know, all the way down to Miami on the East Coast, we have to remember that relatively speaking, Austin is still a fairly affordable region nationwide. Yeah, yeah. So just keeping it in context is key, especially as things will continue to evolve and change into the fall. Well, Claire, what are we seeing kind of week over week in terms of market activity? We were a touch slowed earlier this week, um, and we're heading into a holiday, which, of course, will skew things. Where are we at? So activity, early indications suggest that activity has waned. We'll get those official stats in early next week. But, of course, 
with folks taking off early for the long weekend. And we have to remember, too, that since July 4th is on a Tuesday, falls on a Tuesday this year, you know, odds are that, um, you know, a higher proportion of workers are going to be taking off from at least Saturday through Tuesday, if not the Friday before, et cetera. So it's we're going to see slower activity this week as well as next week, that being the week of the 4th. Um, but we should see things, you know, start to pick up as yeah. folks trickle back in from vacations. None of which should be surprising. People are out and about and maybe they're stuck in airports or maybe they've gotten to their destination. But <laughs> no matter they're how you're delaying you... the purchase of their home. Probably. Yeah, no matter how you dice it, <laughs> they're probably not focused on home purchasing right this minute, which is OK. Exactly. Well, guys, thanks so much for joining us today. We're glad to bring you this episode of Driving at Home. We'll look forward to talking again with you soon. Claire, thanks for hopping on. Thanks for having me. 